For me, theater comes from the Greek word theatron, which means a place of seeing. And they had just meant it as a place of seeing, where you sit and where you see. But I love the metaphor of that. I love what that means, a place of seeing, seeing what, seeing a new perspective, having a paradigm shift, having something change completely what we thought was before. I see, I understand, you know? So for me, theater is the art form of practicing new understanding, practicing offering up a new way of looking at something that someone might have never thought about before. And all of the classes are how to support an artist in the way that they have tools to generate these spaces of seeing for an audience. Right now I'm teaching a class called Public Solitude, solo theater via contemplative practice. So um, I knew I wanted to teach a solo performance class. I've directed a lot of solo performance. I knew that I wanted a space in which people were able to think and reflect deeply as opposed to perform, right? But to really grapple with what the relationship is with the audience when you're one person to them, as opposed to I'm talking to this person, I'm talking to this person, I'm talking to this person, right? And, and being able to model human relationships, not by seeing people interact, but by having the direct connection and interaction to the audience. And what does that mean? Like if you actually had their names there, and then there's just that one tick, as you spoke about them, that might be enough just to help us understand like the inside of this person, whatever gesture that, you, that is as you speak about them. Like if you perform a piece for a man, she will tear it apart without, without question. There is no hesitation. And her insight is immediate and relevant. She encourages all forms of art. Whatever you know, your piece may take is fair game as long as you believe in it and as long as you can um, defend it and present it and work hard on it. And I think that's something that I never realized before. I think strictly when you're learning theater and when you're a theater major, you uh, have a tendency to follow very strict guidelines and, um, you know, theoretical ideas of what is theater and what is art. But with May Ann and in May Ann's classes, um, it's just everything can be a fair game. And I think that's really beautiful because I've seen some things that I, I wouldn't have even thought of as being performative and I've done things that I wouldn't have even thought that I, I could do or I could present on and I think that's been really powerful. This is how the world works. The world works by each person is very, very attuned to their own suffering and other people's privilege. If we flip that and we became really attuned to our own privilege and other people's suffering, just imagine how different the world would be. The fact of the matter is, is that Asian Americans, we do have to come to groups of a lot of anti-blackness in our community. There's a lot of racism in our community as well. And we are taught to white identify. We're taught that that is the way. Be invisible, be a model minority, white identify, you'll get by, you'll be fine. That's how I grew up. That's what I remembered. And it's only a lot of, uh, a lot, I think in my 20s, I started to direct work that talked about internal racism. And then I started to understand that. I started to unpack a lot of those things, right? So I think we as a community have a lot of work to do. Absolutely. And who are we as a community? That's another thing. This monolith of Asian America was not created by us per se. How different are we all? The Chinese and the Japanese do not get along and they are not the same. <laughs> There's something that I keep hearing, Chinese and Japanese, the same thing. It's so not the same. My mother would still be very upset if I was dating a Japanese person because of how cruel the race was because of all the Japanese occupations that she and her mother lived through, right? Now, people, a lot of people don't understand that. They don't understand all the dynamics within the different kinds of Asians in Asian America. And at the same time, we also have gathered together for some sort of solidarity 
because a lot of the hatred and the bigotry, we all receive it, despite the fact that we might do it to ourselves, right? So I think there's so many complex things inside of that that we have to start to like heal and unpack and check ourselves and figure out how the intersection of all of these things, you know, what, how, how are we, are we on the streets for Black Lives Matter? How necessary is that if we're going to say we're people of color too? Or do we just show up when it's like women, right? What are we showing up for? So for me, I think it's really important in our community to really look deeply at everyone and know that we can't just be on our own. I think that just watching the way that she interacts with her students in class is really inspiring, especially um, as someone, like I'm really interested in facilitation and so watching her facilitate other students is really amazing in the way that she holds space for people's work um, and in the way that she really like focuses and pays attention to, um, to their intention of their work, which is really important as a theater professor um, and just as a professor in general. I think she's always attempting to clarify um, and specify within people's work. I just directed a play called The Paper Dreams of Harry Chin by a wonderful Hapa playwright named Jessica Huang, who is from the Twin Cities. She was commissioned by the History Theater. She had pitched them a project about this story, um, A Paper Sun. So a, a paper son were Chinese immigrants um, who came in in the 40s via a loophole in, in a, the Exclusion Act. So we have a very complex story about a Chinese immigrant coming here, becoming an American, loving his family, and all of the ghosts and the baggage that is still there that prevents him from maybe having a relationship with his daughter who doesn't understand why her mother left. So in directing this piece, it was just this like incredible opportunity to look at the immigrant story through a very different light than my own, while at the same time having these resonances of the shame and humiliation that you go through when you're immigrating to this country. Forget about quaint toy shop and the little brick houses, the hunger and the quiet and the dirt. Think crowds, think wide alleyways, think paved roads, think big. Forget about your mother. Forget about your grandmother. Forget about your brother and your other brother and your dog. Forget about your home and the creek and the weather and the birds. Forget about the potatoes you grew. The children fishing in the creek out back. The streets turning to mud with spring rains and the creek flooding right at the bend. Forget about me. Forget about us. Forget about our dreams and our plans and our promises. Forget your home. The creek that floods, the children that fish. Forget your family. Grandmother, brother, brother, dog. Forget your name. Chung Yu. Your name. One of the radio um, hosts, we would talk about all of these things and then she asked me, well, why do you want to do it? I was like, well, I'm really profoundly interested in the way that we are haunted by our memories, that we have to, we have to struggle with a lot of things that are unresolved. What does that look like on stage? What does the fragmentation of our soul look like on stage? All of these things. And she just kept looking at me like, like there's not enough that I was saying. So I just kept talking and talking about these things. And she said to me, you know, I'm just really surprised that you're not saying because it's Chinese. And I looked at her, I said, everything I've said is Chinese, is about being Chinese. I am Chinese. My specific is universal. Your idea of what is specific is not universal. You don't understand that my specific is both that everything I say about family, this is Chinese, <laughs> you know? So it's really fascinating to me, the separation of Asian American as foreign and not American. You know, I didn't used to want to think about it. 
I didn't want to accept that it might be harder for me or something like that. You know, I, I didn't want to face any of that. Part of it is because I feel like I was always taught not to ask for handouts or to, you know, and part of me doesn't want to overstate my own struggle. Um, and I did that for a long time until I realized that privilege is real that there's a lot of privileges out there and systemic racism and all of that that is real. And if I do not honor my own struggle, I will also do the same thing to other people. I will also not honor my African-American brothers and sisters and peoples in terms of their struggle. You know, I started to understand that it is necessary to understand systemic injustice and how we are located within that because if we do not really see it clearly, we won't be able to dismantle it. We just think, oh, I'll just work really hard and it's my fault or whatever. And I'm all about taking personal responsibility and working as hard as we can and doing all of that, but also we have to do it with open eyes and understand what's happening, understand that the way I'm talked to is different from how they would talk to someone else. So yeah, there are obstacles. I mean, Mayan was the person who taught me to be contemplative in my theater practice and to not act with haste and to not act without bearing. I, I, you need, like, like, even apart from dramaturgy and research, you need to be mindful of everything that you're doing on stage. But I remember being in tech in this last show and I'm looking around and I'm thinking of all the people here if you took a picture of us and said, who do you think is the director? I would be probably one of the last people you would point to and say, that's probably the director. And in, and in that moment, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna do my best to like earn this, to earn the honor of being a leader. Um, be, because it, we, we don't have enough of us to be out there. And that's what I continue to see. And that's why I, I'm always sort of pushing myself to do my best so that, so that it's um, no tokenism, you know? Um, but uh, I can be as good as anyone else. Oh, she's just, she's wild. She, she lives such a colorful life and she really just, you know, has a, a passionate desire to touch everyone she works with and, and to learn from everyone else, but also to give what she has to offer. Um, and I think that's such an important part of being a teacher is to learn from the people you're working with. And her openness to that is incredibly inspiring. I have always asked myself, what am I doing this? Shouldn't I be like running a nonprofit and saving, you know, young children who are being caught up in sex trafficking? Because I feel very strongly about that. Why am I not running an organization that does that? Why am I not doing something useful? And I remember this story that I love. Morgan Janess, one of the great dramaturgs of this country. Um, she has been involved in incredible work for many, many years. She tells a story. She says that she was feeling really down at some point and realized that she was like, why, why are we even doing theater? Why theater? And she knew that Mother Teresa was uh, going to be in New York City. And so she stalked her <laughs> to ask her a question. And she waited outside the hotel she knew she was staying at. And she finally saw her and she went up to her and she said, I need to ask you a question. I would love to have more purpose in my life. Can you tell me how to have more purpose? Should I come and help you, serve with you? How do you, you know, what should I do? And she asked her, Mother Teresa asked her, what is your field? And she says, I'm a theater artist. And she said, in my country, there's the poverty of the body. And so we feed the people. In your country, there is poverty of the spirit. Feed that. The theater happens between here and there. It doesn't actually happen up there, by the way. And it doesn't just happen here. It happens in the space between us. So what is the path you're drawing between me and you? And if you're drawing so many paths, I don't know which one to follow. 
So I'm all for abstraction, but what is abstraction? And how do you construct something so that you can deconstruct it? Or how do you construct something so that there are added layers to it? As opposed to just sort of like putting it all together. But that's also, I mean, that's also another way of creation. But I just want you to know what you're making. And 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 if you're if you're whole purpose is saying to confuse us and to give us so much that we're not sure what we're doing and then all of a sudden, boom, it's that. That's a different kind of structure. Like she said in class today, theater does not happen on stage and it does not happen in the minds of the audience, but it happens in between. Um, so like trying to, trying to maintain control, but then also knowing where you don't have control. That's something that I learned from her. This is the predominant way I manifest into the world. Um, and this creation of new ways of understanding and seeing is a profoundly beautiful thing to me. And I'm grateful for every moment I have in that room or classroom in which we get to understand just a little bit more. I'm a seeker. I'm a seeker of truth. And that truth is always shifting, as we know. So how much more deeper an understanding can we get into ancient wisdom? All of that is my path as an artist. I'm really um, compelled by trying to understand the intersection of artistic, civic, and spiritual practice right now. So that to me is um, the, the, the artistry of seeing, the civic nature of being engaged in the communities that I serve, and the spiritual practice of um, connecting to the divine, whatever that might be. Um, theater is not just about entertainment or experiencing someone else's story. Um, I like uh, how the Vedic sutras talk about theater. That theater, um, good theater, should do three things. It should entertain the drunk, which to me is connect with people, engage those who would rather be numb engage them. The second uh, rule is to reveal the way the world works. And the third is to show us how to live. Now, in order to do those things, you must be fearless. It's fine to be filled with fear, but then how do you work against that? How do you, how, you know, I work in China a lot. There are a lot of things about revealing the way the world works there that can be very dangerous, right? There are some things that it's just very difficult to say in public. So how do you do that? How do you also show us how to live within the constructs of what we're given continually? What is that? So I teach these classes in order to address all of these issues that to me are beyond theater. But through theater, I'm able to find some way to sort of understand the human condition more be a civic um, person, right? Through these classes, I'm able to investigate the intersection of artistic, civic, and spiritual practice. So I, I guess, I guess that's, that's why I teach. When I first started the class, um, I don't know, just the way that she teaches, it's not like she's just reading something out of a book and then teaching it is. It's like she's practicing what she's teaching as well as like teaching it to us. And, and I feel like that's very, um, I like that about man's teaching element because it kind of makes it feel like we're not the only ones learning. Um, and then she's like taking the time to learn each and every one of us, I feel like her teaching us those things um, just really put it into perspective like what we're teaching and just the ways that she knows so much about it it's like she's learning as much as she can and through her learning and teaching of us we are learning as much as we can and so it's like these bouncing of energies off of each other. Every time I talk to someone and say like what do you do and I ask them to talk about it I talk to my activist friend they're an organizer they gather people together to like make change, do something. I'm like, oh, we do the same thing. Or I talk to somebody who 
is um, a managing director of a company and they're like, well, I have to inspire people towards a certain goal. I'm like, oh, we do the same thing. So at some level, you know, I think that like there are a lot of things that are similar. I can't imagine really an alternative different life for myself. I feel like I feel like I've been chosen. I feel like I've chosen and and I I can see how everything that has happened to me has been like bringing me to this point in time and that I'm where I should be with the understanding that everything might change and I'm okay with that too but I I I really I don't I don't often think about like what could have been I do often think about what will be and uh, I think that that's something that spurs me on more and I also practice being where I'm at yeah, I think one of the um, main things that I have learned from her is that, and this kind of goes along with like the meditation that we've been doing in class, is just that um, instead of trying to like change aspects of yourself, like to sort of like be with it and to sit with that and to accept um, and to notice what's going on within your body, within your mind, within your heart, and then taking that information in order to make work, I think it's like a really ingenious way um, to, to make work. Um, and I think that it will impact the way that I am in the world in general, just because like I'm learning how to sit with myself um, in a way that I never have before. So I'm really grateful to her for that. This is a secret that I'm telling you, but my undergraduate degree is in finance. And I did that because I wanted to be a good Chinese daughter. And my parents were also scared about me being a starving artist. And I was also scared of being a starving artist. Who, who, actually, who actually wants that? Like you have to have a lot of privilege and a trust fund to be like, I want to grow up to be a starving artist, right? So um, I feel like that's something that I struggled with all the way through college. And um, I never really had the confidence to do it. And so I thought, well, I'll do finance. You know, my older sister, uh, did finance and she does very very well and and everyone loves her so I thought you know I, I should I should just do the way that everyone app will approve of me and then I remember being in my senior year and looking up accounting internships and thinking to myself is this my life this life might be right for somebody else but is it right for me and I remember feeling physically nauseous at the thought, and please, no offense to accountants anyway, I know lovely accountants who have wonderful lives, but it wasn't right for me. It wasn't, it wasn't the, the space I was supposed to be in. Um, and I think that that was the big change for me when I, I started to apply for different internships, um, uh, professional theater internships. And despite the fact that I was, had a finance major, I was doing a lot of directing in, in, in college. And what happened was I got to the point where I started to look at these internships, I said, I'm just gonna apply and not tell anyone. Mm -hmm. And there were only, I think, two internships in all of the United States that would pay enough to live on, or that would give you housing mm -hmm. and a little stipend. Everything else you would sort of have to pay to do, and I knew I wasn't able to do that. So by some miracle, I got this internship at Berkeley Repertory Theater, and that changed my life. And I've only made a living in theater and film ever since then, even though I have a finance undergraduate degree. I remember then saying that my goal was to work with people I loved on pieces that were of importance to my community and that were filled with beauty. And um, I don't think I've changed at all. I feel like the privilege of being able to be in a creative space with people you love, with the chance to grapple with things that are important to a community or that the community might not be able to talk about, but you're doing it and then you're putting it out there as a platform. Um, and to make works that are filled with beauty and beauty is complex, I don't mean pretty. I mean things that have um, a great amount of resonance 
things that might remind us of something that we didn't know how to articulate inside of us. All of those things I think are, are the goals in terms of being in a room together with other people. Being in a room to search for truth together, that is honestly all I do. And I do that as a professor and I do that as a director. Nan is like taught a lot in this class and I feel like um, the more the more faith that she puts into the world, the more like positivity there will be. And so I feel as though anything that I have gained from this class, I will be able to like just use it in every way, creative wise, or just like um, just like teaching it to other people or my family, um, or just like writing it down and just like um, keeping it something that I always like like think about or put in my head. I think that there is a role for all of us in every field. Wisława Zimborska, one of the great poets, Polish poet, she says in her Nobel Prize speech, she says, people think that artists have a monopoly on inspiration. That is not true. She says, as long as you do your work, your job with love and imagination, that is inspiration. If you do your work of love and imagination, you can be inspired as well. And it's not like who's doing something, who's not doing something. It doesn't need to be you are better than an actor or an actor is better than you. It's we are filling an important role wherever we are at and whatever we have chosen to do with love and imagination. Wise words for young artists. Uh, get out of your own way, I think is a good one. That's something that I've been working on for a long time. That's the thing that will stop you the most, is your own doubt, your own fear, standing in your own way. And be kind to yourself with that. Say like, I invite you to step over here. <laughs> Fear? Thanks! Step on over! <laughs> Hello again, doubt, my old friend! Laugh at those voices that tell you that you're not supposed to be doing what you're doing. Encourage yourself. Encourage others. Be a, be a voice towards that. Um, and study. And what I mean by study is Deeply investigate the world, yourself, your family, people you care about, things you don't understand. Have a curiosity that is boundless and uh, love that's infinite. <laughs>